I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews and an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. Many of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. For nine years, I lived on the brink of a volcano, a volcano called communism, a volcano which is centered in Soviet Russia, but which is erupting all over the world. Through fissures in the social structure, the lava of communism has eaten its way until it has engulfed whole countries and subcontinents, burying freedom and the dignity of men as deep as Vesuvius buried Pompeii. That's the future the communists plan for free men everywhere, mister. So take warning from my story. It's the story of communism. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked An Un-American Activity. When the Politburo of the American Communist Party ordered my district leader to report to them in New York, I was instructed to take over his duties. That was a week ago. And I've heard nothing more from either the Politburo or my district leader. I don't like it, because the closer you get to the top of the Red Organization, the closer you're watched. And I know there's always a chance that I'd make a slip, a slip that could be fatal. I'm in my room, assembling some new special study party literature and extracting copies for the FBI, when my phone rings. Hello? Hello? Yeah? Wanted here immediately. Well, uh, I'm putting together some packages at the moment. I'll, I'll be over in an hour. A car will be calling for you immediately. Don't keep the driver waiting. But look, I've got to... No. I don't like that kind of phone call. It may mean nothing at all. Then again, when you're a communist for the FBI, it may mean something very important. Number four is a red meeting place used only in party emergencies. And this, obviously, is an emergency. I put back the copies of red literature that I'd held out for the FBI, just in case my room is searched while I'm gone, and go out to wait for the car that's to call for me. But there's no waiting. The car's at the curb when I walk out of the building. And the driver swings open the door. As I walk up to the car, he says, You sure, Dick? Yes. You did. What's up? We're late. Hang on. Hey, what's the big rush about? I just take orders, comrade. My orders are to bring you to number four, right now. This is number four. I've been here. Well, get out. They're waiting for you. And I have another job to do. Thanks. You're certainly never going to get into trouble for talking too much. All of our comrades had that driver's discretion. This meeting would not be necessary. I don't believe I've ever seen you before. Possibly not, but you'll know me well before the matter is finished. Now, get inside quickly, comrade. The enemy may have spies watching this place. Right up those stairs, Comrade Svetik. I know the way. Well? Before I take any more orders, I want to know who's giving them. 
You can call me Comrade Walters. I'm a member of the party security committee. Now, please walk up the stairs. There are others waiting for us. As we climb the long, dimly lit flight of stairs that rises to the party's dingy office, the fear that never leaves me rises, too. There's a red security officer at my back, and I don't know what's ahead. Then we reach the top of the stairs, and I open the office door. Quiet! Now that Comrade Svedek has arrived, we'll get down to business. I've been sent here to warn you and to help direct your fight against one of communism's worst enemies. The Washington Committee is preparing to subject this area to one of its degrading public circuses. One of our comrades has secured a list of those who will be subpoenaed, including the names of those rats who've actually volunteered to serve the persecution as friendly witnesses. This meeting is to determine what action we should take against these swine. The Reds' reaction to Comrade Volter's announcement is so violent that I wish every fellow traveler and parlor pink in the country could hear it. They hate the committee, of course, but their hatred for friendly witnesses is much deeper. They'd like to give them the sort of red justice that has purged thousands of innocents in the communist homeland and its satellites. We ought to give them a trial, then hang them! Well, the thought is admirable, comrade, but not practical. We could beat them until they were afraid to talk to the committee. The next suggestion was for a series of accidents to befall the deserting comrades. A speeding car on a dark night, a fall from a high building, all the impossible-to-prove murder methods that have ever been used before. It was an idea that appealed to this group of scared and frustrated Reds. And I knew I had to sidetrack them right then. I'm no hero, and I didn't want to buck that mob. But some of the friendly witnesses are people who've made a mistake, and they want to correct it. People on our side now who've seen the Red side, and they don't like it. It was my job to protect those people, no matter how scared I was. So I stepped up and opened my big mouth. Well, Comrade Walters! Comrade Volters. Yes, Comrade Svedek. I'd like the floor for a minute. You have it? Okay. In the first place, I want all the comrades to know that I hate these rats who are willing to become friendly witnesses. However, any action against these people before they testify would reveal that we have a source of information close to the committee. Quiet! Just what would you do about these traitors, Comrade Svedek? Well, before the subpoenas are issued, I'd talk to them. How do you talk to a rat? Some of us would remind them of the party's purposes. Others would talk about a member's obligations. And if that fails, Comrade? Well, if that fails, Comrade Volters, after the subpoenas are issued, is time enough for coercion. But still no violence? No. The threat of violence is enough. If it's accompanied by a smear campaign and phone calls every 15 minutes, stay at night. Besides, right now, we should spend our time and energy preparing our campaign against the real enemy, the committee. Do you have any suggestions concerning that, Comrade Svetty? Yes, if you'd like to hear them. We would. Well, my suggestion is to organize every group in the city in which any of our comrades are members into public opposition to the committee and its persecution. You mean labor unions, industrial councils, business organizations, and so forth? Yes, with paid ads in all the papers denouncing the committee and its unconstitutional violation of the Bill of Rights. You're talking like an idiot. I'm talking as acting district leader, and I'm telling you how to organize public opinion against the committee. Force them to stop their vicious harassment of party members. Now, Svetik, you know that we don't have enough party members in any labor union, any industrial council, any organization in this city to force any one of those groups to pay for ads attacking the committee. Don't be naive, Comrade Walters. These organizations won't know anything about the ads they're supposed to be sponsoring until they've read them in the papers. We'll place the ads, and we'll pay for them. The organizations will disclaim them. It won't do any good. Because the ads will be signed by comrades as members of the various organizations. Individuals. Obviously. And like most people, Comrade Volters, you don't read the small and up in advertisements. Our ads will be signed by, say, Matthew Savetic for the Independent Workers Association. Oh, no, that won't mean a thing, Svetic. It will to the casual reader. 
And particularly when the Matthew Severic is in normal size type, the Independent Workers Association in type four times that size. And the for the so small it can hardly be read. <laughs> With the Red's enthusiastic acceptance of my plan for attacking the committee, I was also able to wangle an agreement to try my suggestion for dealing with the friendly witnesses. Then the meeting broke up and I hurried to make my report to the FBI. This is important and startling news, Matt. The Washington Bureau is going to be greatly disturbed at learning that the commies have a pipeline from the committee. What about the friendly witnesses? We can't do a thing for them officially at this time without taking a chance on exposing you. We're not supposed to know that the Reds have a list of those being subpoenaed. But these particular people are genuinely on our side now. They're trying to help us. We have to protect them. I don't mean to sound heartless, Matt. But there are bound to be casualties in any war, even a cold war. Till the subpoenas are issued, any protection these people get will have to be given obliquely by you. I see. Don't take any unnecessary chances, Matt. What you've told me, it's obvious that the Reds are frightened. And frightened men are always the most dangerous. Yeah. Well, if Washington wants any more details, we'll contact you. Good luck, Matt. Strictly unofficially, I wish you hadn't stuck your neck out quite so far. During the next few days, I was on quite a merry-go-round, organizing the Reds' campaign against the committee, and at the same time, planting evidence that I hoped the FBI could use to frustrate the campaign. I almost forgot the problem of the friendly witnesses. Then the subpoenas were issued, and Comrade Volters paid me a visit. The hierarchy is quite unhappy with you, Comrade Svetik. What do you mean? About the handling of the friendly witnesses. Although in my reports I've stressed the seeming excellence of your proposed campaign against the committee, I've been forced also to report the failure of your plan for handling our traitors. Mere talking to them has done nothing to change their minds. Then our comrades can't have done a very good job of talking. You think you could do better? Certainly. If I hadn't been so busy with this other matter... In that I... case, forget the other matter for a day or two. Yeah? Yes. And you uh, talk with these white-livered weaklings. Show them the error of their ways. Okay. And be your most persuasive, comrade. If your plan fails, the responsibility will be yours alone. And the group deciding your punishment may not include a comrade Sveti to sidetrack their violence. <laughs> responsibility will be yours alone. Volters is right. No matter what happens, the responsibility is mine alone. If the friendly witnesses wilt under pressure, I'll feel responsible to the American people. If they don't wilt, if they testify against the communists, I'll be the guy held responsible. I'll be the guy who pays. to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sivetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI and the second act of our story. Or else, as no other interpretation of Comrade Volter's orders for me to talk to the deserting comrades and dissuade them from appearing before the committee as friendly witnesses. As soon as I feel it's safe to leave, I go out to a phone booth and call the FBI. Hello, Warren speaking. I'm calling from a phone booth. I recognize your voice. Go ahead. Now that the subpoenas have been served, the heat is on. On you? Yes. And I'm supposed to transfer it to our friends. We can help now. How? By giving our friends a little vacation before you reach them. I'm supposed to get to them immediately. Give us half an hour before you try to see any of them. Then go through the list of friends alphabetically. We can't prove anything against you if you can't find anyone to talk to. I hope that's the right answer. It has to be. We 
can't take a chance on one of the witnesses identifying you as the goon who put the heat on him. Okay. Anything more? Yeah. One of our men spotted a couple of security committee goons getting off a plane about 20 minutes ago. Watch your step. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I wait a half an hour before trying to reach the first of the friendly witnesses Volters has ordered me to pressure. But my FBI contact has made good on his promise. When I return to Comrade Volters at number four, I'm forced to report that all of those party traitors have been taken into protective custody. I don't envy you your position, Comrade Svidek. It was you who persuaded the group to delay punishing these rats. Yes, but to protect the party. Protecting the party is the business of the security committee. I'll explain the situation to the security committee. They want to talk to me. They do. In fact, two of the comrades arrived in town just a short time ago. For your sake, I hope your campaign against the committee is more successful than your suggestion for handling rats. For the next few days, we're all too busy making last-minute preparations for the committee hearings for Volters or his two goons to give me any trouble. They're hanging around, of course, but the local comrades, swallowing their own propaganda, are so confident of chasing the committee right out of town that the goons adopt an attitude of wait and see. The night before the first day of the hearing, the entire group meets at number four for a final report and briefing. Quiet, please. Now, tomorrow, comrades, in the hearing room of the Washington Committee, we will fight the battle for freedom. Tonight and tomorrow morning, every newspaper in the city will carry pages of ads denouncing the committee and its flagrant violations of the Bill of Rights. Outside the building, protesting working men and women will pick at the hearings. Comrade Volters! Yes, Comrade Mercer. I'd like to make certain that all comrades who've been designated to pick it as working mothers make arrangements to borrow their babies for the duration of the hearing. Very good. Good. Comrade Volters! Comrade Ryan! I would like to remind the war veteran who is under subpoena to wear his combat medals to the hearings. And to throw them at the committee's feet when he's called upon to testify. The Reds' attitude has done a complete about face since the night of the first meeting in number four. Then they were frightened and frustrated. But tonight, they're ready to man the barricades. Behind the protection of the Fifth Amendment, of course. One misguided idealist even goes so far as to compare this meeting with those held in 1776. And as the comrades grow more exuberant, I grow more depressed. As soon as I can, I get away to phone the FBI and make my last report before the hearings. But I don't have to make the call. I'm waiting at a street corner for the light to change when a car pulls up beside me. And my FBI contact says... Get in quick, man. Okay, Matt. We ought to be safe now. Let's have the final rundown. It doesn't look good. For our side or for you? For either. Well, let's have it. The Reds are really organized this time. Everything from babes in arms among the pickets to veterans with war medals among the witnesses. What's their attitude? Confident. Those scheduled to appear before the committee tomorrow are going through last-minute rehearsals with their lawyers. Ah. The picket chairmen are making a final check of their groups. Volters and a goon squad are still at number four. Are they anticipating any violence? I haven't heard of it if they are. Say, drive me back near number four and drop me. Okay, why? I want to have a talk with Volters about violence. I have an idea that may save my neck. I'm glad you came back, Comrade Svedek. I was just discussing you with comrades Mercer and Ryan. A thought came to me while I was on my way home that seemed so important that I came right back. You're full of thoughts and ideas, aren't you, comrade? Well, I try to give the party the benefit of any idea I may have, comrade Mercer. Such as don't use violence against rats. Yes. I still feel that any violence would have engendered serious reactions against the party. What was this new great thought of yours? I wanted to warn you against any violence on the picket lines tomorrow. We weren't anticipating any. What made you think of it? Nothing, really. It just occurred to me that reactionary members of some of the unions or industrial councils whose names we're using in tomorrow's ads might come to the hearings and try to stir up trouble. Oh, I see. And you want to urge us against using violence? I'll go further than that. 
As acting district leader, I absolutely forbid it. What? You are forbidding me to use my own judgment? The party cannot... The party is no place for anyone with a yellow streak up his back, Comrade Smitty. If anyone gives us trouble tomorrow, we're going to fight back. Maybe if we crack a few heads, we'll make some red-blooded converts. <laughs> this Jake Martin, head of the Labor Division of the Steel Industry Council? Yeah, that's me. I just called to tell you that there's an ad in tomorrow morning's paper which gives the impression that the Steel Industry Council is supporting the communists in their attacks on the committee. There's a what? There are other ads purporting to show that many of the labor unions are also behind the Reds in their fight against the committee. Try to tie labor into their filthy work, huh? You know where we can find these people who are responsible? Well, Mr. Martin, a lot of them will be picketing the Chambers building. That's where the committee is holding its hearings. The next morning, the comrades are jubilant. Living on a strict diet of propaganda, they're the world's greatest suckers for the printed lie. They've all read the ads in the papers, and even though they know how the ads were inserted, they've kitted themselves into believing that the city's entire populace is rising behind them to drive the committee into hiding. Up in the committee room, the friendly witnesses are giving damning evidence against the party and various party members. But down on the street, the pickets are proudly carrying their signs, too blinded to realize that the expression in the eyes of the average passing American is a mixture of growing hatred and contempt. I'm standing off at one side watching the scene when I see a group of shirt-sleeved working men approach, led by a man I know as Jake Martin, the Steel Industry Council labor leader. I walk over to where, hidden from the Reds, I can be handy when Jake wants to ask a question. My timing is good. Who's running this Red Parade? I don't know for sure, but they seem to be taking orders from that big fellow over there, by the statue. The one with the two thugs standing in back of him? Yeah, that's the man. I think they call him Comrade Volters. Comrade, huh? Come on, boys! We'll teach these skunks to use the name of labor for their dirty propaganda! You boys, bust up the picket line! But leave that comrade boulders to me. Now, let's go. As soon as the two lines crash into each other, the police move in, and I get out of the area. There aren't many comrades present at number four that night, and of those who are there, I'm the only one without a bandage which doesn't please Comrade Volters at all. Where were you when the fighting was going on, Comrade Svedek? Phoning headquarters in New York. Phoning? To report that despite my warnings, despite my absolute order, you had deliberately engaged in street fighting. You reported that? Direct to headquarters. Oh, you snip. I'll teach you to run to headquarters. Sit down before I knock you down. It won't hurt the party any if I get violent with you. Now listen. You listen. Now look. I didn't start anything. First I knew about a street fight was when that guy came up and hung one of my jaw. You threatened to use violence last night, Comrade Volters. I reported that, too, together with the fact that you played right into the hands of the committee, giving them valuable propaganda to use against the party. Well, I... I... You're to report to the Central Committee in New York tomorrow morning. No, I'm not going back. It'd be suicide. I wouldn't be surprised, Comrade... It's a pity, too. It's such an un-American activity. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me what you had in mind when you asked me to drive you back near number four, Matt? I was afraid the Bureau couldn't endorse the instigation of a street fight. <laughs> I didn't see any other way to save my neck. Well, you were right on both counts. Incidentally, the Washington office picked up the rat who was passing along information he felt from the committee's files. Was he working for the committee? No. His girlfriend was a secretary in the committee office. She was transferred, though she had no idea he was a communist. They're not going together anymore. I don't know what you mean. Oh, I had a girl once, but not anymore. I guess that's part of being a communist for the FBI. <laughs> The 
committee and comrade Volters have left our city, but the scars they left on the party will be a long time in healing. Because I was right and Volters was wrong, the local comrades are working overtime and trying to make me forget that they were against me. I have a lot of invitations these days, but I'm not accepting any. The people I'd like to be with, plain, average, everyday Americans, want no part of me. And I want no part of the Reds, except as a communist for the FBI. So, I choose to walk alone. Dana Andrews will return in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews. The struggle between freedom and communism affects your life every day, directly or indirectly through battle tolls or taxes. It's a struggle you can't afford to lose. Although to protect innocent persons, the names, dates, and places are fictitious, the danger they warn against is very real. Next week, we'll bring you another strange adventure based on the fantastic experiences of Matt Savetic. Join us, won't you? 